This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. What is up? Our first ever homecoming edition of the Farm Monitor. Yes, after two weeks, he is back. Uh, Our own Kenny Burgerby, everybody. We uh, missed you, pal. Yeah, thank you. I see what you did there. Yeah, good to be back, especially when the lineup looks like this. Now, coming up, this may look like wasted food, but for one company, it's income and a way to benefit the environment. Also on the program, the Farm Monitor drone takes you to the skies of Glenville, Georgia, for a look at a unique fruit with many good qualities and uses. We sit down with the owners of Sweet Georgia Fuyu and hear why they feel it just may be the perfect fruit. And then later, although the calendar says October, let's be honest, it still feels like summer. The perfect time to get out and enjoy the garden, even get your kids involved. Paul Puglis with some tips on how to make your next gardening adventure a family affair. All this and more right now on the Farm Monitor. Well, now that we're getting into fall, drivers, listen up. Please, please be on the lookout for farm equipment. As part of an awareness campaign, Georgia Farm Bureau, the Georgia Department of Agriculture, and the Governor's Office of Highway Safety are asking drivers to slow down, eliminate distractions, and give farmers plenty of room while they travel from field to field. John Holcomb has more. As the weather starts to cool down and field work gets in full swing, many tractors and other farm vehicles are traveling the roads of Georgia. It's very important for farmers to be able to use roadways, and it's also very important for motorists to be safe. When you're out in the rural area, a lot of times, you know, the motor in public forget about whether or not you've got farm equipment that's on the road. So what we're trying to do with this campaign is to bring awareness to let the motor in public realize that they've got to share the road with uh, farm vehicles. Today's farming operations often have multiple properties that can be spread out which means farmers oftentimes have to use roadways to get from field to field. When I started farming in 1973, <clears throat> pretty much our farming operation centered within just a, a mile or two of home. Uh, we had our different farms that we had that we farm. But now as, as, as farmers, we have to get bigger. We have to farm more land because of our equipment cost and all of that. In order to be able to pay for that equipment, we got to farm more land. So that means we have to spread out a little more. So now there's a lot of cases, particularly in South Georgia, where these farmers may be farming in three or four counties, even across the county line into Florida, even in the edge of Alabama. So there's a lot of movement up and down the roads. Not to mention the fact that farming equipment has gotten much bigger than it used to be. Many times we have wide equipment. And sometimes we cannot get off the road when we've got mailboxes or signs or something, or even a vehicle may be sitting off the side of the road. So we want to encourage the, the, the general public to realize that uh, sometimes we cannot get out of their way in time. However, it's not just the motorist's responsibility. Farmers have a big role in safety as well. There's other responsibility here too. There's responsibility on us as, as, as producers, as farmers, and as the ag community. We've got to follow the laws too. We need to make sure we've got flashing uh, beacons on, on our equipment. We've got to have more slow moving vehicle signs. We've got to obey those. Uh, we've got to be you know, careful about our hours of operation. So that, to the extent we can, be sure we're rested, make sure uh, that you're prepared to do the work. And so all of these fit together in a perfect you know, responsibility between the public and the ag community. And Recently, a public service announcement video was produced that will run on television stations throughout Georgia to help spread awareness of highway safety during harvest season. There are far too many Georgia families that have been impacted by unforced errors, unnecessary, preventable accidents. And we're just hoping that yet again, we can come together this fall, use the vast resources of Georgia Farm Bureau, the Farm Monitor, and you know our networks within the, the, the media that we all share. And perhaps, you know, these efforts, if it helps save one life, if, if it helps prevent one accident, it's worth all of the, all the investment and all the time. Reporting in Bremen for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. Although the numbers vary, studies suggest that each year Americans on average throw away over 100 billion pounds of food, material that can be turned into nutrient-rich soil through composting. 
One startup company in Athens is now making that process easier than ever for businesses to participate. Damon Jones has the story. You know the old saying that one man's trash is another man's treasure? Well, that's the basis behind composting is it takes items thrown away on a daily basis, such as food scraps, grass clippings, and paper products, and turns them into something very useful. So composting is just the decomposition of organic material into humus. So it takes uh, carbon and nitrogen, they get mixed together, it's about a third nitrogen and two thirds carbon, and then they magically just work together and through a process of you know, bacteria working in the air, they just make soil. Not only is this finished product great for lawns, farms, and gardens, but it also provides a huge benefit for the environment as well. It also serves as a carbon sponge, so it can actually take CO2 out of the atmosphere. So not only are you diverting it from the landfill, which is just so good for the environment for a number of reasons, but once it's applied, it then takes even more CO2 out of the atmosphere. So it's just one of the best things you can do for the planet, and it's fun, and it's easy. That's why in 2012, Kristen decided to start up her own company, Let Us Compost, to make the process more accessible to the community by actually coming to the customer. So compost service is just like a trash service. You just have a green bin. It's got a compostable bag in it. You put all your waste into it. You tie it up. You take it out to the curb. It leaves. After it leaves the curb, it goes right to the composting facility, which is 20 minutes down the road, and it gets turned into soil. Over the years, a number of businesses around Athens have taken notice and signed up for the program, including Chick-fil-A and Terrapin Brewery. Uh, as a business and a brewery, um, you know, we're going to inherently make waste, and we want to figure out the best way to reduce our overall footprint as a brewery, and composting is a huge avenue for us to do that in. And so far, so good, as businesses have really taken to the idea and are even looking to do more. I mean, from a commercial side, we're uh, really excited about it because I think we're doing the right thing by trying to take waste and create soil from it. Uh, really excited with the results so far and uh, really can't wait to dig in a little more. However, Baskin hopes that this is just the beginning of a growing industry as business owners start to recognize just how beneficial composting is and how easy it is to do. But I don't think, you know, restaurant owners realize like how amazing it is to have a facility 20 minutes down the road that you, you know, you, you put your food into a bin, it goes 20 minutes down the road and six weeks later it turns into soil, which is then getting given to, you know, farmers all around Athens. I think, you know, a lot of businesses understand that they have a trash can and a recycling can. Maybe they should have a compost can there too and, and look into the, the uh, opportunities and benefits there can be from composting and how you can just be a better citizen and also a better company in the community that you live in. And that's really the main goal for businesses like Let Us Compost as they hope to spread awareness throughout the community. We want as many people composting as possible. If our business makes money, that's great. If some other composting business makes money, that's awesome. Um, I just really want this to work and for it to be totally normal in Athens. Reporting from Clark County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Well, they may have a funny name, but don't mistake them for their bitter relative. After the break, a crash course on the Fuyu persimmon and the couple who decided to roll the dice and grow them here in Georgia. Welcome back to the show. In South Georgia, there's a new player in town. The persimmons fool you. I know, I know. When most people think of persimmons, they think bitter, spine tingling. Heaven forbid you bite into one that's not ripe. However, the fool you persimmon is much different. It's a fruit Laura Potts Wirt and husband Tom have spent time and money perfecting. And as the owners of Sweet Georgia Fool You in Glenville, Georgia, they feel it's something that once you taste, you'll instantly be hooked.
whenever I uh, sell the persimmon at farmers markets, I'm also there to educate people about the fruit. One of the common things I hear is uh, people think it's like the wild persimmon in Georgia, which can be bitter or astringent. But this is an Asian persimmon. It originated in Asian countries. Uh, it's actually the national fruit of Japan. It's celebrated in Asian countries and they know the fruit well. It's a sweet fruit. It's never bitter. It's always sweet. Uh, it eats like an apple or a pear. You can just eat it as fresh fruit. You know, Tom can speak for himself. He's from a farm family. They've farmed for over 100 years. And, uh, but I think that's one of the things we have in common. You know, we really love the farming way of life. Uh, we love being outdoors, uh, working with the land. I love to cook and work with food. And so I just am really excited about working with a fruit that I can do so much with in the kitchen. You know, we miss the farm and we, and we were looking for that same kind of lifestyle here. And we thought, well, this could be done. Oh, no, people don't do that here. They grow peanuts, they grow cotton, you know. They do. I go, well, why can't they, you know? And we started looking around and we found other people who thought the same thing. Why can't, why can't other things be grown here? And so we thought, you know, why don't we buy a farm here? And why don't we grow, why don't we grow persimmons? We love them, you know, they're great fruit and there's not enough being done with them and more people could really you know, enjoy them, you know, they're a good fall, wonderful fruit at the fall, and they're different, you know, and they're not like everything else. And although maybe you have people you want to, you have to explain to them what they are, but, you know, that's a, the that's a fun of it too, you know. Here we have um, 175 acres, we planted 16, uh, and you know, we're developing farming practices as we go, you know, like what's the best way to do this here, you know, because this is not California, you know, I mean, you realize that the humidity, you know, creates uh, challenges for farmers and uh, you have to meet with meet those, um, you have to meet those challenges. Some of the products I make with the persimmon are persimmon pepper jam, persimmon butter, and persimmon ginger jam. And then I also have the uh, Georgia Grown Trail Mix that includes the dried persimmons and then just the, the dried persimmons. And then I have other products in development. There, there are just so many things you can make with a persimmon. And then this year my goal um, has been to be at the State Fair and so that worked out really well. I also got my manufactured kitchen license so I can sell in the Georgia Grown store there. I just take my product and leave it there for two weeks and they were also nice enough to let us have our fresh fruit there at the market this year. They said there aren't many requests for this because they don't have a lot of fall fruit to work with. So they were more than happy to work that out with me. So we're going to be there this fall with our kids. We're going to have samples and we're going to have fresh fruit and then products at the Georgia Grown store. I do want to mention that uh, the city of Glenville has just been wonderful. Uh, that's one of the reasons we chose this farm is we really liked this farming community. Uh, we liked Glenville and as we've been here longer we've gotten to know more people and I just want to say that they've been wonderfully supportive and interested in what we've done. The newspaper has done a couple of articles about it. I'm a member of the Garden Club here. They've been very supportive and uh, so that means a lot to us to to be newer to a farming community, but be uh, so accepted and supported by them. Great couple, really enjoyed spending time with Tom and Laura. Well, you know, fall is a great time to visit wineries and breweries. Up next, a report on how one brewery is taking advantage of the new farm to glass concept. Craft beer is brewed with much more than malt and grain. Dozens of agricultural products like fruits, grains, honey, and spices are used to give each batch a unique flavor. In the past decade, Virginia has become a hot spot for craft brewers, and some brewmasters are opening farm breweries where every ingredient is raised locally, so-called farm-to-glass operations. 
The Zurchmead family is a pioneer in raising local foods in Loudoun County. We've been farming this piece of property here for the last 26 years. So we started as a, uh, a fruit and vegetable farm and have evolved over the years with other aspects of the business. Uh, we opened up Dirt Farm Brewing. It uh, officially opened in uh, 2015, in uh, July of 2015. And then uh, um, we've, we've been using those skills that we've learned farming over the years and we are now value adding that product into the brewery. Like most farm operations in Virginia, this is a family affair. Wes Shobe is one of 19 grandchildren of the owners of Dirt Farm. He came back to the farm after graduating from Virginia Tech five years ago and became interested in the new brewery. Now he's the head brewer. What makes our product stand out is our ability to use fresh ingredients. Um, we have barley planted that we're gonna, we've already harvested and we're gonna use um, in our product. We have all the fruits, um, spices, grown fresh on the property. Um, and that's, that's something not a lot of breweries can, um, can take advantage of because they're in industrial parks uh, and they have to you know, source their products elsewhere. But you know, having that, that ability to go straight to the farm, straight to the, uh, the source, and, and incorporate that into our product is, is ben very, very beneficial for, uh, for us. A recent study estimated that the craft beer industry contributes more than $8 billion a year to Virginia's economy. It's more than just jobs at the brewery. The ingredients used in making craft beer are high quality items and earn growers a higher price. Janelle Zershmead with the Dirt Farm Brewery says they saw the rising demand for locally sourced ingredients in craft beer, including fresh fruits and vegetables, and decided to take advantage of their production expertise. The industry is definitely growing and we're proud of that. We, you know, we we're kind of on the forefront of, of getting this industry um, going. So I, you can see it in the consumer's interest. They're really intrigued of of what we're doing on the property and you know creating as local as farm fresh of a product as we can and and they're appreciative of that and you know it's definitely we're getting the support through the consumers so and and as the industry grows we get more support with the agricultural side um, and that helps too of figuring out you know the hops and the grains and you know what can grow well in Virginia. The Zurchmeads are always looking for new and inventive ways to make a living off their farm. So the farm to glass movement was an easy business decision for them. They like to find new ingredients to put in their beer and new ways to get the younger generation excited about working on the farm. And they're always thinking of the future. You know, we're a family operation, so it's always been about farm and family. Uh, we, we really, it, it's, it's, it's about the beer, it's about the product, it's about uh, the farm and about getting those, those products into a value-added uh, uh, brew beer. But it's also, for me, it's about retaining open space. Uh, we've, you know, we've, over the years, have we started in one spot, then we acquired another piece of property, then we acquired this property. And, you know, these would be houses if it weren't for us to be able to make that value-add and turn uh, a farm product into, a, into something that will help us pay for the property. Virginia is a regional leader in craft breweries with more than 200 of them listed on the Virginia Craft Beer Trails website at virginia.org slash beer trails. There are more farm breweries opening every year, making it possible to enjoy a unique craft beer anywhere in the state. Just remember to have a designated driver to allow you to enjoy the scenic views on the way home. In Loudoun County, this is Dave Miller. Uh, cheers to that story. Mm -hmm. Well, finally this week, two months and counting until Christmas, and yet here in Georgia, we're still wearing T-shirts and kids are ready for school to be over. Mm, sounds like the perfect combination for some outdoor fun. Here's Paul Puglis with the latest Extension Corner. Hi, I'm Paul Puglis with the University of Georgia Cooperative Extension. Today I want to talk to you about gardening with children. I have a five-year-old boy at home and we like to get him out in the garden and I'm a firm believer that anybody that has a child should either have a garden at home for that kid to get a good gardening experience or 
help your local school start a children's garden. It's a great experience for kids to learn about science, technology, engineering, and math, all those STEM sciences that are really important to developing that, that young person. Um, so when you're looking at developing a school garden or a garden at home, you may want to start with a raised bed garden. It's a lot easier. It's a smaller space that you can easily tackle, and it's going to be a space that's easier for that young person to be able to work that area as well. One of the things you want to consider too is the size of the bed. Make sure they're not any wider than maybe three or four feet wide so they can easily reach over that bed without having to walk in it. That's the whole point of a raised bed garden is to not have to walk in it and not have to compact that soil. So once you get your garden uh, built, you can, make it out of, uh, you can make it out of boards, you can make it out of concrete blocks. Uh, I've found concrete blocks are actually one of the cheapest and easiest things you can do to make a, a, a raised bed garden. They're about eight inches deep, which is just right. You can even fill the holes with topsoil and plant in the holes too. So again, make it a fun experience and make it something that's manageable for your school or your backyard garden. As far as what to plant, um, if you're looking at a school garden, consider only planting leafy greens and root crops in the wintertime like carrots and lettuce and kale, you know, those things that'll survive the cooler months of the year. In the summertime, if you're not using that garden, especially a school garden, it's important to cover that garden with clear plastic and kind of let it take some time off in the summertime because the last thing you want it to do is grow up in weeds and come back beginning of the next school year. Um, and have to pull weeds and, and do a lot of maintenance work to get it back up and running again. So it's okay to take the time off and just cover that garden, like I said, with plastic. That's the best way to put it in time out. Probably the most important thing when, you, when you're working with kids is to make sure you have kid-sized appropriate tools. And that means making sure you invest in gloves and tools and things that they can actually use in the garden. Whether it's pulling weeds, watering the plants, there's you know, small water buckets and things that are uh, appropriate for kids that they can pick up. Um, there's all, th all kinds of things that they can do in the garden. And sometimes you know, the plastic tools that you use in a sandbox might work, uh, but they actually have real tools that work even better and last a little bit longer that are, that are kid size as well. So consider investing in those nicer tools, especially if you're going to have a school garden and continue to use this for many years. Um, there's a lot of good options. Most hardware stores um, and local feed and seed stores will carry some of these tools and things that you can do to keep your, your children occupied. Um, again, try to make it fun. Make sure you get a wheelbarrow. Make sure you get them a, a little lawnmower or something that they can feel like they're involved with that gardening experience. That's so important to keep them involved throughout the year, even if it's something really small that they can do to keep them occupied. Something else to really encourage young people is to make sure you uh, buy books um, and read to them every night and teach them about gardening. They're going to learn a lot with those stories during that story time. Um, there's a lot of good books out there, everything from Diary of a Worm, which is one of my favorite ones if you want to learn about composting, The Secret of the Apple Tree, even even Dr. Seuss and Curious George have books on gardening that you can use with your kids. Um, so there's all kinds of age-appropriate books about gardening, and so make sure you invest in those with your children. The last thing, the most important thing, is that those kids actually get to taste their hard work, and they get to harvest it out of the garden and enjoy it on their plate. So that's something that I would encourage you to do. It encourages kids to eat more vegetables, which is probably not a bad thing, and we all need to eat more vegetables at the end of the day anyway. So getting them involved with growing them, cooking them, even preserving them and canning them all the way farm to table is part of that experience as well. So if you have any additional questions, feel free to call your local county extension office or go to our website at ugaextension.com and be sure to follow us on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Great suggestions, Paul. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you for watching the Farm Monitor. Now, before we go, a reminder that for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure you check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us right here on the show. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.